Hey everyone, uh, day five, last day of the week, last day of uh, Breakfast from Life. Remember, all this week we've been painting from life, trying to do, again, very, very different paintings. They, they, you know, it's best if they feel different. Obviously, the easiest way to make them different is by changing our subject matter, which we're doing. But, you know, also trying to just shift the composition a bit, uh, change the uh, uh, color relationship that you have in each painting. So we're trying to push ourselves. That's, that's what's cool about doing these daily exercises. It's just about keeping our mind kind of busy and uh, just training the way we see things and how we can change our perception. We can translate our perception into paint. So for this last day, uh, I'm painting a little bottle of kumis. I don't know if people drink kumis. I don't know if I saw it ever when I lived in, um, in New York, but uh, it is pretty common here. My dad used to absolutely love drinking. He would drink from a big bottle and it's actually super refreshing. You wouldn't think so, but oh, and what it is, it's, it's like a fermented milk uh, drink. Uh, but uh, if you kept it in the fridge and you drank like a big glass of it, it's like super, super refreshing. The only bad thing is just kind of slimy on your throat. So, you know, it was, good. <laughs> it was refreshing, but then you have a slimy throat. Uh, but it's essentially like this uh, white little plastic bottle with like a foil little cap and which was just crazy fun to paint because it, it, it you know, I'm not trying to do this super, super naturalistic uh, depiction of tin foil. I'm just trying to see, you know, what, what it can provide me so that I can change it into a fun painting. Uh, so I'm doing that. We're finishing with a very, very simple, but nice painting. And in terms of colors, there's going to be a different play of colors uh, today. I would say there's, there's, um, there's like a, a yellow, green, blue, very cool, uh, dominant hue painting in there. It almost feel like it feels like it's painted at night. So I, I actually liked the uh, mood of what is essentially like a white little plastic bottle. But because I'm the sort of painter that when I'm very, I'm very sensitive to hue shifts, so if I see something bluer, I actually push a, a ton uh, you know, of that hue and actually make a, a big difference. Sometimes even sacrificing the unity and value. I think that that's the way I would uh, describe myself as a painter. So I hope this is uh, an exciting way to finish uh, week three. And remember, next week, it's a whole different thing. So we're always gonna keep uh, <laughs> being excited about painting. That's, that's our hope. Uh, and that's it. I'll see you guys next week. Keep painting. Okay, let's uh, paint some kumis. <laughs> I hope that if you don't know what this is, um, you you look it up or you try to find it in you know some store somewhere in your town. And you know if you like milk, uh, I'm pretty sure you're gonna like this. So <laughs> so at least if it you know if it spurs your curiosity, um, I'm I'm pretty sure you're gonna you're gonna find. And maybe you're going to be a new fan of, of Kumis. And if you are, just credit the painting, please. Just say that after seeing this painting, you became a lifelong uh, Kumis drinker. <laughs> but anyways, when, when I was going to paint this, I thought of uh, pouring it in a glass and just putting it against a white background. And... I wanted to do this because I've had this obsession and I did tons and tons and tons of paintings, you know, many years ago of um, what you would essentially call like a white on white painting. So what that actually describes is a painting where the, um, the value range is very, very, very limited. Like you're choosing to only work within a very constricted set of values. And it could be as constricted as you as you want. I did many of my paintings um, that were probably, you know, uh, two steps of value or a step and a half of value. You know, between all the mixes, it, there was nothing but two value steps. Uh, now, if you think about it, it's like, that's crazy. You, you can't really do a painting like that. But the truth is, you know, over 100 years ago, um, Malevich did um, the white-on-white -white painting. 
So <laughs> even though it was completely abstract, it did depict what you know the condition that I was so so interested in painting. And um, I did a, a series of paintings like that, and I absolutely loved them. I loved that what was sacrificed in uh, in contrast, in terms of contrast that you could get by having in a painting, you know, a lightest light and darkest dark, a value zero and a value ten, um, you would gain in atmosphere. And I thought I was willing, I was more than willing to actually produce paintings that lived in this kind of soupy atmosphere. And I did, like I said, I, I did objects, I did people, atmosphere, um, interiors, and I absolutely loved it. I, I really do think that I, if, if there was a, a parallel timeline in my life, I could, I could have just spent the rest of my life just painting within a very, very limited range of values. I absolutely love it. Now, I thought that was what, what I was going to do. I was maybe going to have a, a, you know, a glass and pour some, you know, uh, gummies, essentially some milk and put it against like a light background. And then that's it. I was like, yes, I'm going to paint this. But then I, I, I saw the little bottle and I was like, well, I, you know, this tiny little shift, as soon as I put it under my light, I was like, well, this tiny little shifts, you know, in this bottle and I'm sensing like, it, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny little hue changes, you know, it was yellower in some areas, more purple, greener. And I was like, ah, oh, that's going to be so sad to sacrifice those just to push um, essentially like a very... Uh, light painting, like a like a high key painting, and um, even though paintings like um, you know small winter landscapes that Edwin Dickinson painted, or the um, the Sargent painting of the uh, umber gris smoke, I think the fumes of the umber gris smoke, something like that, uh, that very famous uh, Sargent painting that's essentially been called white on white, although it's not quite really. It's just that it's a very limited value range, but in Sargent's case, this there's so much like hue mastery. He's able to work with so much color within such a limited value range that you know he he's he's outside the competition. He he you know that's only those are things that only Sargent could do. But you know I immediately shifted because many times when I want to paint something, I don't really know exactly what I want to paint, and I have to try and discover it. You know, while I'm setting it up, and then when I'm when I'm looking at my palette, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna push this quality. And when I saw when I put my light on this painting, my my halogen light on top of this painting, uh, I had chosen like a blue green, uh, a little somewhat dark uh, little paper to be the uh, backdrop. And I thought, wow, this is this actually reminds me of like a night painting. Uh, it doesn't. It has that feeling of it being like very, very blue, like a like a blue green projecting this darker, again bluish green uh, shadow onto this paper, and it was overall coolness in this painting. I can tell you that the warmness that you can sense in the painting. It's not that I'm mixing a ton of cad red, let's say, in my mix because I, there is yellow, but it's a lemon yellow, so it's a yellow green, which is actually you know, very cool. It's a lot cooler than, let's say, a yellow orange. Um, so it didn't come from the yellow, and a lot of the red that I was using was almost being swallowed up by the uh, blue. And I'm only using one blue. I'm only using ultramarine blue. So I don't have cobalt to maybe change my hue a little bit. All I was using in my mixes it was dominant ultramarine blue. So when I saw it, when I saw this painting that I, and, and I acknowledged, okay, this is actually turning into a very, not monochromatic, but very uh, uh, ultramarine blue dominant painting because it is in the light, it is in the mid-tone, it, it, and it is in the shadow. Uh, it, it, I, I immediately thought of Frederick Remington's um, night paintings. It had that feel of those night paintings. Although Remington's night paintings have that deeper shadow where there's almost no light filling it in. There's no bouncing light and there's nothing filling in those shadows. So they look like stark, dark. They do have like a bluish tint to it. I, I, I immediately went there. And it's funny that I, I tend to always go to illustrators when I'm thinking about, you know, 
nature or what, what I'm looking at when I'm painting. And the reason is easy. I, I've told you guys before, but I am an illustrator at heart. I, I studied illustration. I wanted to be a comic book artist when I was growing up. I actually started in, in SVA, you know, uh, the uh, cartooning major. And I, in my mind, I was going to be a comic book artist. That is until I saw Stephen Sell paint and that, that was it for me. I was like, okay, no, now I want to paint. Um, but I still absolutely adore illustration. So it got me thinking about um, Remington's uh, night paintings, which, by the way, I think he is the master of painting at night. I mean, just the the uh, the skills, the observational skills to understand like those those hues and those values, those greenish blues was just absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, the cool thing is that, and this is you know my cascading mind. That's this is how it works. Uh, when I started thinking of Remington, I also thought, again, within the illustration realm, and because I was talking about uh, Cornwell yesterday, Dean Cornwell, I thought of Meet Schaefer. And the reason I make all of that connection is, by the way, these are all people that were in New York. They were in the Art Students League. So that's, you know, we can we can say, yeah, that's where the connection lies, lies in. Um, even though Cornwell did study at the Art Institute in Chicago, but then he went to the Art Students League. And... I think he did study um, under Harvey Dunn, and I'm pretty sure uh, Meet Schaefer st uh, studied under Harvey Dunn, but I think in Pratt. I think he went to Pratt. But uh, to be honest, they all knew each other. It's impossible for them not to know each other. Uh, Remington was of an earlier generation than Schaefer and Cornwell. He was actually a little bit earlier. He he was, um, I don't know if not quite contemporary, or maybe he was. Uh, with Howard Pyle, who was the teacher of all illustrators in like American illustration, um, so I actually my mind went there because uh, Meet Schaefer has a ton of these paintings that I was talking about yesterday that they were reproduced in magazines in um, you know one color and black. So they would have green and black ink, or blue and black ink, or red and black ink. So the illustrators were, or orange and black ink, those, those were probably the more popular ones. So the illustrators were, were really conscious of this, and they actually painted their paintings knowing that there was going to be a limitation to the reproduction. So a lot of, there's a lot of Meet Schaefer paintings that are painted with blue, black, and white. So those three colors. And what's cool about it, and I was thinking of one in particular, there is a sort of cream color that's also in the painting that you can feel it throughout the painting that would make you think, oh, he's using some sort of yellow ochre or some Naples yellow, something like that. But, but what he was using was the, um, the cream color of the, um, of the ground, which was probably like let white, um, show through. And that, you know, basically that ground became a color you know, against those grays that were from black and white and those bluish, you know, grays also and the blues that came from mixing the blue with the black and white, uh, you got a whole other color just by using that colored, in, in that sense, that colored ground that was pretty much like a very creamy, creamy white. So I immediately went there and I thought, wow, I can actually start doing a painting that it's not, it's not a night painting like Remington's. Um, it's not going to have these these very dark, deep shadows and and values that have to be, you know, knocked back because you know this, the the moon. Let's say because that's that's what um, Remington painted like moonlight. Um, the moon isn't a such a strong light source as uh, the sun. The moon actually reflects light, but it's not a source of light. Um, so I I thought well I don't have to. I don't have to res uh, restrict my values in that sense, but I can actually, you know, kind of navigate this painting within these um, greenish, you know, um, yellowish lights, and they transition to these bluer, kind of neutral, but very rich. I was trying to do very, very rich. It was really important for me for that shadow, that plane of that little bottle that goes in, goes into shadow. To be very transparent. By transparent, I don't mean literally transparent that you're making thin down paint. I mean transparent in the sense that 
light is actually filling up some of that shadow and it's giving you a sense of you know the atmosphere that surrounds it so th that's what usually painters uh, when they're describing a transparent color it's not the the um, physical quality of the pigment there are you know transparent pigments like let's say um, uh, transparent red oxide or alizarin crimson those are transparent pigments but no when we speak about a transparent color uh, you know and, and specifically when you have to mix it we tend to speak about it being able to be like let's say in the shadow mass but still hold a lot of color information because of the lighting condition that's uh, surrounding it and affecting it. So I wanted it to be a little bit lighter feeling than those more contrasty night paintings. Um, but I, I also love the fact that it was projecting this very kind of looming shadow, this very stark uh, shadow. And while it wasn't like very, very deep, dark, it was still blue. There was this uh, blue color to it that made it really, really nice. And the reason that I, I was reminded of, of Remington and then meet Schaefer is that I thought, wow, I, I love how the, again, the ground looked against all those restricted colors or that limited palette, how the ground became a color um, in meet Schaefer. And I loved how, you know, in Remington's paintings, there was always like a lantern or a candle or a light source that, that was a very warm light source that gave you you know, a ton of contrast. They, they essentially became, you know, like we did yesterday, a painting about the contrast of complementaries by, you know, the light being sort of yellow-orange hue, and then the overall atmosphere had like a, a bluish kind of color to it. So, you know, you were doing, you were essentially painting uh, orange and blue, you know, painting. So I thought about that, and there's tiny, tiny moments in, in my painting the, where the highlights are actually not just straight white because well I don't I don't like to say things are mistakes it sounds very dogmatic but that's um that's a risk that we usually take when we decide that it, it's going to be just white because we say okay it's actually the lightest light in my painting and it's a, a very high value so if it's going to be the lightest thing that I can paint is just straight uh, titanium white in my case, that's the white in my palette. But the truth is, you you can speak about value that way and say, yeah, you can use your titanium white. It is the lightest color in your palette. Just just use it. But you can also speak about the temperature of the light, and you can also mix something so that that highlight is actually going to feel like it pops. And what I did was, since most of my painting had a blue dominance in all of its mixes, um, again, the light was you know, um, my lemon yellow, my bismuth yellow, and ultramarine blue with a tiny bit of, of alizarin crimson. So all of them light, all of them uh, cool colors. Um, and the area where it transitions towards the shadow, which is more purple, it has uh, same colors, but more of the alizarin and the blue in it, in the, in the mix. I thought, well, you know, if I actually go for an orange, it could be a cool orange. I can mix um, my bismuth yellow and alizarin and a little bit of white. No, well, actually a lot of bit of white. I'm going to get like this kind of cool orangey mix within this blue that's going to really pop. It's going to really, really stand out. And that's what I did. So these tiny, tiny little touches. Um, actually feel like they're really, really sitting on top of all this blue. And they actually, they, they speak, they start speaking about my light source and how this light source, uh, while it is a cool light source, it actually has these moments where it may appear warmer in some areas. Now, mind you, warmer doesn't mean that I'm going to go for my cat red. Warmer just means that I, within the context of my painting, I just have to mix something that makes it look slightly warmer. And if I'm really, really, you know, controlling my mixes and I'm very mindful of all the other areas being affected by that blue, once that I introduce that orange, it's going to, you know, it's going to make such, such a huge difference that the colors are going to play off each other in, a, in an absolutely wonderful way. Uh, that little tinfoil cap that uh, is, is, uh, is all bent up up there, it was just a chance to have 
fun, really. I didn't go into it thinking, wow, I need to really express all these like tiny little breaks and folds and and see you know in in every single facet of that foil how everything else is being reflected i thought well if i'm going to do that it's it's going to be a mess it's going to be noisy up there and it, and it's way way too complicated uh to be painting that little moment up there as just this singular exclamation point in the painting so i thought again let's let's make it simple let's synthesize and and let's see if I can find, uh, pick and choose my areas of interest. And and that's exactly what I did. And by the end, it was a very simple painting dominated by a single hue, which was blue. It's everywhere. That ultramarine blue is absolutely everywhere. It's in every, every single mix in this painting. So it gives us a ton of unity and a ton of harmony. But again, using what we did yesterday, which was very obvious, I think, with that big green mass of the pear and the big green ma uh, red mass of the uh, background. Today it was a little more simple. It was it was just a tiny tiny bit of orange in the highlights amongst the sea of blueness that makes the painting again kind of like zing. And sometimes you need to be very bold and pick two large masses like the pear painting and sometimes it has to be just like the slightest sprinkle of of a hue amongst this, you know, bigger, bigger um, mass of of another hue, and that's all you need for the painting to just come alive. So, again, every single painting, every every single painting that we can do every day, is a new opportunity to learn something about color. It's it's a new chance to say, "Wow, I'm going to try this out," and not to entirely forget your past experiences. Uh, because you do build upon them, but ideally, I think the ideal condition of a human being is to be able to, yes, have access to experiences that shape you and teach you, but also, you know, have the eyes of like a newborn and just look at things, you know, anew for like the first time and for you to be absolutely in awe of what you're looking at because, I think that in many ways painting deserves to be looked in that way and it becomes very boring when all we're doing is just imposing our knowledge onto a piece of canvas or a piece of paper or cardboard or whatever you're painting. So um, just just that as a reminder as we're heading to our break and uh, w next week we we start a whole other you know <laughs> a whole other theme week with just something totally different to paint. Just, just remember that it's uh, every painting is a new opportunity to learn. So, uh, have a great weekend, guys, and I'll see you next week. Bye.